It is November 15th, 2022. And our patient is going to be having surgery on his back. Our patient has had nine years of back pain and pain in his right leg, sciatic pain. The pain in the back comes from uh, the discs at L45, L5S1. I made that diagnosis based on his exam where his pain was localized to. Can you guys see the back here, Henry? Yes, we do. So <coughs> this line here that we marked on the skin is in the middle of the back. And when I saw the patient in clinic, I said, where is your worst back pain? Where do you get the pain? And he said, right in here, in this area, okay? Well, I know from experience, this is L45, L5S1. So I looked over at his MRI, and sure enough, he had a tear in the wall of the disc at L45, a tear in the wall of the disc at L5S1. And the discs were herniated, they were bulging. So this one up here is the L45, and this one is the L5S1. Okay, so when I saw the discs on the MRI and I knew that his pain was right in this area and it was characteristic for the kind of pain people get from a, from a damaged disc. And for those of you who don't know, people with back pain, chronic back pain, where the belt runs, 85, 90% of the time it's coming from a damaged disc. So that's the number one culprit. So we're going to get started, okay? I'm gonna give you a little injection of some medicine. Don't move around. Our patient is awake. <coughs> All of our lumbar and thoracic Duke laser disc repairs are awake. Nice job, Dr. Berndez. They they're awake for the beginning of the surgery because I need to safely get into the disc that I'm treating. And the only way I can do that safely is with the patient help helping me. And they are basically letting me know if I'm a little too close to the nerve root that I'm gonna be passing underneath. They'll actually tell me. So, let's get started. First thing we're gonna do is navigate down to the disc. That first disc there, the L5S1. Jordan, would you show us the L5S1, please? <coughs> there you go. Can you guys see the x-ray at L5S1? Yes, we do. That is the L5S1 disc. Show them where the tear is, Jordan. You all see the white arrow? The tear is in the back of the disc. That's the back. And that tear is where all of his back pain is coming from. We figured this out at Duke Spine Institute. Nobody else in the world figured it out. It was done here by uh, research that was conducted by myself, Arius Duke Majin, my son, and a few of other my staff at the time who are no longer here. But this procedure that we've developed to treat the pain from the disc is very successful. We've been doing this procedure now for 16 years here at Duke Spine with over 1,500 patients treated. Sir, can you feel anything? Are you awake? Let's wait until he's fully awake, shot. So we are right behind the foramen. Show them the foramen. No, stay there. Let's show them the foramen. There you go. So you see the white arrow, keep circling it. Now what is a foramen? A foramen in Latin means a hole or a passageway. And it literally is a passageway for the nerve coming out right there. Show them where the nerve comes out, just under the pedicle. First show them the pedicle of L5. That's correct. It goes side to side, front to back. Yep, that's it. Show them the bottom of the pedicle right there. Show them the black line. There you go. That's the bottom of the pedicle, which is a piece of bone. Just under the pedicle is the nerve root. That's going to be the L5 nerve root. Show them where the L5 nerve root will be. Make a circle because it is a circle. There you go. Now you notice where we are with the needle. We're at the bottom of the foramen. That is the most important thing you have to do. Now I'm going to tell you a secret. The type of surgery we're doing is called endoscopic spine surgery. And in the lower back, it's called transforaminal endoscopic surgery. There's probably only two or three surgeons in the world, including myself, that do this type of surgery at L5S1. The rest of the endoscopic surgeons, and there's not many of them, they will do a translaminar approach. What is a translaminar approach? It means they're gonna drill away the bone in the back of the spine, take away bones and ligaments and part of your joints, called the facet joints, in order to get down to the disc. And when they get there, they're not gonna fix your back pain. They're only gonna try to fix your leg pain. 
But the problem is 99% of people with leg pain also have back pain. So people want both fixed. They want their back pain fixed. They want their leg pain fixed. We can do that with the Duke laser disc repair, but it's the only surgery in the world that treats both. And we do a transforaminal at L5S1. The problem is most surgeons cannot get into the disc like I do right now because they don't have the training and skill to do it. We do it all the time here at Duke Spine Institute. <coughs> all right, so are you awake? All right, let me just document for you. He's had nine years of back pain. Let's remember that number. Why is that important? <laughs> nine years. <laughs> I forgot my R. So I got to put a little, little carrot with an R because my spelling is, is just abysmal today. Abysmal. Abysmal is the, is the word for the day. A, B, Y, S. M A L abysmal or is it two S's? Arius. He said one S. All right, good. Abysmal. Abysmal describes the quality of someone's life when they're living every day with back pain. <coughs> now, this patient had a microdiscectomy, and when I talk to people all the time, they say, "Oh, I won't do the Duke laser disc repair because it costs too much. I'm going to go do a microdiscectomy." Well, this is what happens when you have a microdiscectomy. You eventually end up here. Why? Because microdiscectomy doesn't work. All right. Reliable? Okay, so here's what we're going to do. I'm very happy with our trajectory at L5S1. I'm going to start at L45. So to get to the L45, we've, we're going to make an incision with a knife. This is an 11 blade. You see how pointy it is? Different scalpels have different shapes. This 11 blade allows us to make a very nice incision. It's the best blade for this type of surgery. And we're going to make a 7 millimeter incision. 7 millimeters is all we need. You know why? Because the tube that we're going to do this surgery with, this tube right here, can you see this, Henry? Yes, we do. That is a 7 millimeter tube. So, I only need to make a 7 millimeter incision to put a 7 millimeter tube in. But we'll start once again with a spinal needle. So, I'm aiming for L45 this time. Shot? All right, we're heading right towards that disc. Now, you want, you want to line up the end plate of four. So, Jordan's going to move the floral, wag it. We call it wagging it. There we go. So, now show them the end plate of four, how nice and straight it is. You guys see that black line right there? That's what you want to see at four. Show them five. The superior end plate. No, 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 no. Superior end plate of five. Right. When you're aiming for the four or five disc, you want the four inferior end plate and the five superior end plate to be lined up. That tells you your, your navigational information is reliable. Show them the pedicle of four. Show them the pedicle of four. Good. See that? Now look at the bottom of the pedicles of four. There's two pedicles, a left and a right. They're lined up perfectly. Show them the bottom how it's one black line. Now go to five and show them the two black lines. See, the pedicles are not lined up at five. Why? Because the patient has some scoliosis. And when you have scoliosis or twisting, the pedicle at one level will, will be lined up on the x-ray, but the pedicle above or below will not. And that's because the spine's twisted. We're not treating scoliosis today. We're only treating his painful disc. Reliable? Shot? <coughs> So I need my patient awake, totally reliable. You okay? You doing all right? Good. Let me know if you're having any pain and I'll give you some more medicine. So this is the part when you enter the frame in, the patient must be awake because they're going to tell you if you're too close to the nerve root, which by the way, I'm almost never, never, never too close to the nerve root. I know exactly where to go, but some people have some weird nerves. Where do you feel that? In your back? You feel it in your back? So I'm at the back of his herniation right now. You see that? Show them where the needle tip is. Right there. It's at the back of the disc of L4-5. Show them L4. L4 bone. Show them L5 bone. Perfect. And we're at the back of the disc. We're going right through the tear. Are you comfortable? He said yes. All right. So I've just passed the needle through the tear. I'm inside the L4-5 disc. That's exactly what we want. The beauty of this technique, folks, 
we are not doing any damage to the normal spine. Microdiscectomy, laminectomy, fusion, artificial disc, it does horrible damage to your spine in order to get those things done, and they don't work. This procedure leaves your spine alone, fixes it naturally without damage. Okay, we're back at 5-1. Are you comfy? I can feel the herniation. Sean? No pain. All right. Well, you got a great anesthesiologist. That's why you have no pain. I can feel the tear. It's huge. Okay, now I want them completely awake because this is the part of the surgery where we're going to verify what I suspected based on my clinical diagnosis. When patients come to us at Duke Spine Institute with back pain, my job is to figure out where it's coming from. And again, I rely on probabilities, statistics, numbers. Okay, life is all built on numbers and probabilities. The probability or likelihood that something is gonna, is gonna be a fact. The fact is 85% of people's back pain comes from one or two or three discs in their lower back that are damaged. So I believe these discs are the cause of his pain. And this is where I get to check because we're gonna do what's called the discogram. And a discogram is not disco disco where you dance and you have a glittering ball and music. It's, it's the disc itself and gram means picture. Are you comfy? You've watched a few of these surgeries, right? Any pain? No pain. All right, he just arched his back pretty bad. How bad was that on a scale of one to 10? That's the worst it got was a 10? What did he say? What's the highest it went? Eight. Eight to nine. Nine, all right, so that was a nine. That was L5S1. Now, is that where you typically get your pain? Is that where you typically get your back pain, in that area? Mm -hmm. He said yes, All same right. area. So folks, that was a nine out of 10. And I'm sorry that the ink is drying out, but that was the L5S1. Show them, Jordan, go ahead and go to the x-ray, um, Henry. Show them, Jordan, the, uh, the, the dye in the disc. Show them the tear in the back of the disc. Look at that giant tear. That black stuff is the tear. That's the dye leaking out. And that's where his back pain is coming from, okay? <coughs> is it better now? Is it better? Yeah. Is the yeah. pain gone? Is the pain gone? Yes. It is. So the pain has gone. So he's doing great right now. No pain. All right. We're going to put you to sleep soon, okay? How bad is that on a scale of 1 to 10? Huh? 10. 10. Is that where you typically get back pain? Yes. All right, you're gonna go to sleep. When you wake up, that pain will be gone. We found it. Count from one to 100 out loud for me. And Jordan, show them the tear at L45. Count from one to 100 out loud, please. Nice and loud so I can hear you. All right, so we had 10 out of 10. It was concordant, right? He made it to five. All right, so he fell asleep at five. So folks, just to summarize, we tested the disc. Before we did surgery, I wasn't 100% sure, but I was about 99.9% .9 sure. We tested the disc at 045. Was it painful? Yes. And more importantly, is that the pain he gets every day? The answer was yes, it's the pain he gets every day. We call that concordant, C-O-N-C-O-R-D-A-N-T. And it was a 10 out of 10. And then we tested the L5S1, the bottom disc. And take a look at that MRI on your screen down at the bottom right corner. That shows you his MRI. L5S1 was also a 9 out of 10, and it was concordant, meaning that's the pain he gets every day. Why is that important? Because, you know, we want to make sure we're treating the pain he gets every day. Now, you can see how much blood loss we have, one drop of blood. All right, we're going to go ahead and we put the guide wire in. We're going to remove this spinal needle. And 
<coughs> we've already made our seven millimeter incision. The next thing I'm gonna do is place the dilator. Now while I'm doing this, um, after I place the dilator, once I get this in position, I'm gonna bring my tube down. Now the whole surgery is done through this small little seven millimeter tube. Unfortunately, folks, you're not gonna have your surgeon recommend the surgery to you because they don't know how to do it. They don't even know the surgery exists. To me, most spine surgeons are like Afghan sheep herders living in the mountains of Afghanistan, and you're trying to explain what a, a B-1 bomber is to them, a stealth bomber, and the technology in that thing. They just are not gonna understand. They can't relate to it. They don't understand what it is, okay? And I don't mean to pick on Afghanistan people. One of, some of my best friends in college were Afghanis, all right? And the point I'm trying to make is simple. When you show a spine surgeon this stuff, they really have never seen it before because it's so advanced in technology, they don't know how to do it. So we're gonna place the dilator, then we're gonna run this endoscopic sheath down into the disc, and then I'm gonna take the dilator out and we're gonna do the whole surgery through that little six millimeter tube. Six millimeters is the internal diameter, seven millimeters is the external diameter. The tip of this tube is gonna be inside the annular tear where the herniation is, and I'm gonna use the laser and endoscope to clean out the tear, okay? So why don't you show our audience the video of why do herniated discs actually cause back pain so they can understand the mechanism of action. Traumatic injury to the disc can cause annular tears to form. Pressure on the disc causes herniation of the nucleus pulpus through the annular tear. Inflammatory tissues develop within the annular tear causing back pain. The inflamed annular tear generates pain signals. Additional injuries can cause symptoms to worsen. Inflammation from the annular tear can spread to nearby nerve roots, causing leg pain. Signals travel up nerves to the brain, causing localized back pain. Pain signals reach the primary somatosensory cortex, causing conscious awareness of pain. If you have a herniated or bulging disc and back pain, Submit your MRI for a free review at www.mri.dukespine.com. Okay, well, we've just shown you our video that Duke Spine Institute created explaining how a herniated disc actually causes back pain. Most doctors can't tell you why you have back pain. They have no clue. They're gonna tell you it's uh, nonspecific, they don't know. And because they don't know where your back pain's coming from, they can't fix it for you. So they're just gonna offer you pain management. Maybe, sh maybe pills, pain pills, maybe shots, but all the treatments they're gonna give you don't work. They're all gonna give you some, maybe relief for a few weeks or a few months at most, but the pain will come back. Only the Duke Laser Disc Repair can cure your back pain from the herniated disc. And if it's not your disc that's the cause of the back pain, it's the facet joint most likely. Now there are other causes of pain in the back further down like piriformis syndrome, sacroiliitis, coccydynia, but disc pain and facet joint pain, well, that's about 95% of a typical chronic back pain and we can fix both of them here at Duke Spine. Can't be done anywhere else in the world that I'm aware of. All right, heading down the rabbit's hole we are inside that L5-S1 disc. Thank you. And by the way, I, I go online all this time and I see these surgeons overseas doing uh, what's called the UBE procedure, which is, they think it's state-of-the-art stuff, but it's literally like a crop dusting airplane compared to a stealth bomber, compared to the Duke Laser Disc Repair. What do I mean by that? It's old technology. They're going translaminar and they're using what's called a unilateral biportal technique where they're drilling holes in your spine 
They're doing everything we do in a microdiscectomy, bad stuff. Removing bones and ligaments from your spine. So that's gonna cause instability over time where your spine will de further deteriorate. We are inside the annular tear, we're inside the herniation at L5S1 right now. I'm gonna bring the laser in. You're gonna see the laser fiber in just a moment, there it is. Now it's the glass thing in the middle that's the actual laser fiber. And then the blue stuff on the outside is plastic. It just protects the glass so it doesn't break. <coughs> it provides support. Now this particular fiber is a one millimeter fiber. That means from side to side on the glass, it's one millimeter. That gives you an idea of how wide this thing is. It's literally point, uh, sorry, 5.8 millimeters across, side to side, in this metal tube. The, the glass is side to side one millimeter. So it's a very small, 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 very precise tool. And it doesn't cause damage. You read about this stuff online. Surgeons that don't do laser surgery are always trying to badmouth laser surgery because they don't know what they're doing. But there are surgeons who do laser spine surgery that don't know what they're doing. So there is some credence to their comments and statements about the laser can be dangerous in the wrong hands. That's correct. But at Duke Spine Institute, we've been using the laser for 16 years. Over 1,550 Duke laser disc repair surgeries done with zero laser complications, zero. The reason why we're able to treat this tissue like this with the laser and not generate heat or cause a fire is because this is a liquid cooled laser. <clears throat> Just like your computer at home, when you have your graphics card or your motherboard, they get really hot. But if you cool them, you keep the heat sink working, you remove that heat and you don't have a problem. You don't get a fire in your computer. But if you don't have proper heat removal strategies in place, it could be a problem. We would have a fire here. So what we do is we use cool liquid, cool saline. We keep it refrigerated in a refrigerator uh, right next to the beer. And um, we take it out for every one of these cases, not the beer. Listen, I got to inject a little humor every once in a while, keep you all awake. So at this point, we're going to open it up to questions. If you're in the audience, you have a question. By the way, the blue stuff I'm removing is the herniated disc. Okay, and I'm using the laser to clean the tear, debride it, get rid of this blue stuff. Sometimes we have to pull out pieces. Most of the time we just use the laser. We'll take questions from our audience. All right, we have two questions from the same person, uh, from Jean Christian on YouTube. Hello, Jean Christian. His first question is, hi, Dr. Duke. How do you locate the tear with precision and align the dilator perfectly to aim for it? Great question, John Christian. So to answer your question, I'll repeat the question so everyone can hear it. Uh, our viewer, Jean Christian from Facebook? YouTube. YouTube, sorry. Asked, how do we locate the tear precisely? And the answer is, the tear is always in the same place. It's right at the base of the foramen that we're coming in. That's exactly where the tear is. Now there's tears that happen in the front of the disc and on the sides of the disc, but those tears don't cause problems. They never cause pain because the nerves that go to the side of the disc and front of the disc are not pain nerves. Well, they are pain nerves, but they're subconscious pain nerves and nobody ever experiences anything bad from them. The, the nerves that go to the back of the disc, where the posterior annulus is, they are special. And I've talked about these before in the past. They're called somatic afferent nerves. And somatic afferent nerves look just like every other nerve in your body. You couldn't tell a difference between a somatic afferent nerve and a visceral afferent or even a motor nerve if you just look at the, um, the axons, okay? What distinguishes this particular nerve Oh my gosh, look at this. Let's talk about this for a second. Folks, that is the annular tear right there. You see the annulus is white. There's another white on the other side. Okay, way over there. And you can see a couple of fibers of the annulus still left. But for the most part, this annulus is ripped wide open. And you see the blue stuff? 
That is nuclear material from the center of the disc, way down here, that is pushed into the tear. And look at the pink. This is beautiful. This is a really good picture here. The pink is inflammation. Those are blood vessels. So it's the inflammation within the annular tear, all that pink stuff. This is perfect. We got to save this, Henry. This needs to go in like lots of our videos. You got it. That is exactly what we're targeting. That's the, that pain is right coming from right there. And we're going to debride it, clean it out. Okay? This is what the Duke Laser Disc Repair does. No other surgery in the world does it. We discovered this here. So I was talking about the pain fibers. The pain fibers are nerves. They look like every other nerve in your body. But what makes them special is where they go in your brain, where they project to, okay, where their destination is. It's their destination that makes them special. And what I mean by special is painful. So these nerves go to what's called the primary somatosensory cortex. And the primary somatosensory cortex is in the sensory part of your brain, where your brain interprets um, um, signals that are related to sensation, okay? You have tongue sensation, it goes to this part of your brain, fingers, toes, and this part of your brain is organized with its cytoarchitecture and synapses. It's been evolutionarily created over time or created by God that it allows the human being to feel sharp pain. Why would we want to feel sharp pain? Well, obviously, we call that a noxious, a noxious stimuli. is a stimulus that causes a sharp pain to be felt in the brain. And we want to know if something is bad, right? If something is hurting us. So um, when you experience a noxious stimulus, a painful stimulus, and it, it creates a painful sensation, it, it draws your attention, right? Suddenly you're paying attention. So if you look down and there's a viper snake biting your leg, you know, then you're going to be like, oh, wow, that's not good. So you'll remember that there was a snake biting your leg and then it created a painful sensation. So there's an evolutionary advantage to human beings interpreting certain experiences um, and remembering them as being painful so that they don't repeat them, okay? You don't want to get bitten by a viper too many times. Um, it's not good. You don't live long enough to procreate. So those kind of genes that don't experience that painful sensation and learn from it, well, they get weeded out of the evolutionary tree. Anyway, it's all fascinating stuff. But to answer your question, you know, the tear is always right when I go through the foramen. It's always right there in the, at the bottom of the foramen. That's where the herniation is. Look at that tear right there. Look at all the inflammation. My God, this is so beautiful. Can you get some still pictures? Yes, most I definitely. I want to use this in our paper. We're going to write a paper very soon. Arius, you need to keep this. That's all inflammatory tissue. Copy that. This is a nice little video snippet. I'd like you to keep this video snippet here so we can put in our publication. Right up to here, okay? Yes, sir. So where I showed you, up to here. That way it shows what the laser does to clean out the inflammatory tissue, the painful tissue. Now we get scar tissue here. That's what this white stuff is right here. That's different than annulus. It's scar tissue. You still have the herniated nucleus, which is the blue stuff. Um, so anyway, I think I answered that question. I know that um, we had two questions from Mr. Christian. Yes. The second question from John Christian on YouTube, they asked, how can you be 100% certain you're not just puncturing a hole in the wall with a dilator besides the tear? Oh, because, great question. So how can I be 100% sure I'm not just puncturing a hole in the wall uh, and that it's actually a tear I'm passing through. Well, first of all, uh, the normal disc annulus, if it's not torn, it's going to be really hard to push through it. It's extremely dense tissue. And I went through it very easily. That's number one. Number two, you could see the tear on the MRI. It's already there. <laughs> Every MRI shows you the tear. Um, I would never operate on a disc that didn't have a tear and a herniation. So. Every one of my patients we do surgery on already has a tear diagnosed on their MRI. You cannot have a herniation without an annular tear. 
Every disc herniation in the world has an annular tear first. So the tear is the first thing that happens. Let's go ahead and show the video one more time of why do annular tears cause back pain. Pay attention, folks. Watch the first thing that happens is trauma, some type of trauma, a football injury, a car accident, slip and fall, work injury, whatever. Jumping off the roof with your skateboard into your pool. You just go to Fail Army. If you don't know what I'm talking about, Google Fail Army, F-A-I-L Army, and you'll see why people get herniated discs. Because the trauma is always something that was done earlier in life, maybe you don't remember it, and that's what causes the annular tear. Once the annular tear happens, now you've got a weak spot in your disc that the herniation comes out of. So go ahead and run that video one more time. Traumatic injury to the disc can cause annular tears to form. Pressure on the disc causes herniation of the nucleus pulpus through the annular tear. Inflammatory tissues develop within the annular tear causing back pain. The inflamed annular tear generates pain signals. Additional injuries can cause symptoms to worsen. Inflammation from the annular tear can spread to nearby nerve roots, causing leg pain. Signals travel up nerves to the brain, causing localized back pain. Pain signals reach the primary somatosensory cortex, causing conscious awareness of pain. If you have a herniated or bulging disc and back pain, Submit your MRI for a free review at www.mri.dukespine.com. Lights on. Okay, great. So we've just finished the bottom disc, L5S1. It's the lowest disc in the back. I'm using a little antiseptic called Betadine. It was developed down the street at NASA. NASA is uh, literally 10 minutes from where we are. Um, we're in the space coast of Florida where all the technology, aerospace technology is. And now we're cleaning out the antiseptic. Now we've never had an infection with the Duke laser disc repair. I've done, as I said, over 1,500 and around 1,550 at this point. Never had an infection because it's so minimally invasive. And uh, we do run antibiotics in to clean things out. But the less invasive your surgery is, the less likely you're gonna get an infection. Also, we don't put screws and rods in cages. We call it hardware. When you don't put hardware in someone's spine, the risk of infection goes down dramatically. So no hardware lowers the infec infection risk. Small incision lowers the infection risk. Quick surgery lowers the infection risk. And uh, the use of sterile technique like lots of sterile technique, lots of things we do. Lowers the infection risk. Incision size and no bleeding, so lowers the infection risk. So all those factors reduce the chance of getting an infection. Oh yeah, and one more. We don't do this at the hospital. It's done in our surgery center, a very clean facility. Unfortunately, when you have hospital surgery, you're exposing yourself to infections. We call them nosocomial infection. It's a specific name, literally. Getting an infection at the hospital has a special name called a nosocomial infection. That's how common it is. No one knows what it's called. You guys want to know what they call when you get an infection at Duke Spine Institute? That's it. Nothing. <laughs> because we don't have any infections. <laughs> Nine years operating here, we've not had a single spine infection. And we even do fusions here. Okay, we're moving on to the 045 disc. Remember, the 045 was a 10 over 10 pain. So we know it needs to be fixed. 
We confirm that with our discogram. Now we're gonna go back through the same seven millimeter incision. Here's the dilator, it's gonna slide right down this guide wire. Our patient is very comfortable, hasn't even moved an inch. The only time he winced in pain or moved in pain was with the discogram. So we've been really good at keeping him very comfortable. Shot. Now the guide wire is just that. It guides the dilator down through the foramen. Let's show our audience, take a picture. Where is the foramen? Yep, that big circle, that big white circle is the foramen. And are we in the top half of the foramen or the bottom half? We're in the bottom half. That's the key to not having a nerve injury. Stay in the bottom half. If I teach you one thing, as a surgeon, you must stay in the bottom of the foramen. Otherwise, you're risking damaging the nerve root, and you don't want to do that. All right, there we go. I can feel we're at the back of the disc. We're going to get started going through. And the reason I use a hammer, a lot of people don't like it, but it's the safest way to do this. It delivers a very um, specific amount of energy. So I'm going to use Luis's hand. I'm just kidding. <laughs> You're like, sure, go ahead. The alternative would be to kind of shove and push, which, you know, if you get through the tear, suddenly you'll push this dilator down into the belly. You could injure something. So the safest way to do it is just little taps. You could see, show them the tip of the, the tube. Uh, that's the hole. Yeah, show them the tip right there. Perfect. Good job, Jordan. So you can see the tip moving in. You want to get it just past the tear. And then we're good. So that should be it right there. You can actually feel the resistance give way. As a surgeon, I can feel when I'm through the tear. All right. We're going to move the fluoro out. We don't need it anymore. We're done with it for the surgery. You can see we've lost two drops of blood the whole surgery, two drops. Now compare this to open back surgery. It's bleedy, uh, bloody, lots of scar tissue with open back surgery. Why don't we go ahead and show our audience a video showing how the Duke laser disc repair actually works. Disc herniations are a common cause of chronic back pain. The inflamed annular tear causes back pain. Inflammation of the nerve roots causes leg pain. A band-aid sized skin incision is made. A small tube is inserted without damaging the bone or soft tissues. The laser removes the herniation and debreeds the annular tear. The annular tear heals on its own. If you have a herniated or bulging disc and back pain, submit your MRI for a free review at www.mri.dukespine.com. Okay, hopefully you understand what the Duke Laser Disc Repair does. It, there's some more inflammatory tissue right there. Not as nice as earlier. This is a herniation right here, the blue thing. That's classic. Now, the disc is quite remarkable. There's only two parts to the disc. There's the nucleus propulsus, which is in the middle. That's this right here. And that's what herniates out. This is a herniation right here, folks. It just broke in, into a piece as I try to retrieve it. And then you have the annulus fibrosis. So let's say it. Annulus fibrosis. Would you mind typing that, Henry? And nucleus propulsus. Now, what happens in a herniation? It's very simple. The annulus tears, and then the nucleus comes out. All right, oh my God, here it is. You got to see this thing. Lights on, please. Look at this. There it is. 
Can you guys see this, Henry? We can see it. That is a nice herniation. We talk about herniations all the time. Most people have more than one, but boy, oh boy, that's a beauty. I'm gonna smack it and give it an APCAR score. Here you go, Luis. All right, beautiful. Now, herniations are usually in many pieces, not one. So it's not often we get to see a nice giant piece. Uh, save that for our paper too. Can you um, give Copy. that to Arius? Yep, copy that. Because we're gonna wanna put a picture like that in our paper. Surgeons love pictures, like the rest of us. Laser. All right, we need uh, four minutes. I assume. Yeah, so what I was saying though earlier was um, the nucleus propulsus is the center of the disc. It's like a hydraulic jelly. And the annulus fibrosus is the wall that holds the jelly in place. There's another tear right there. So this is the L45 tear. Eh, five minutes, I think. This is looking pretty complex. Look at all the golden color. That is calcium, my friends. Calcium is not normally found in the disc. Why are we seeing it here? Because this is a damaged disc. And one of the ways your body deals with damage is to create scar tissue. Another way is to make calcium deposits. And we call those calcium deposits dystrophic calcification. This Dyst yeah, this is the nine-year-old part right here. His back pain started nine years ago. He got the annular tear nine years ago. We're not on a video right now, right? No, 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 we're, we're live. We're back. Yeah, yeah, we're back. Yeah, so if you ask me which disc had the injury nine years ago, it would be this one, okay? And, and Dr. Berndez pointed that out. Good observation. When you see calcium like this, it always indicates an older type of injury, at least a year, two years, maybe five years. You don't see it, huh? Yeah, dystrophic, it's just your body lays down calcium into the damaged tissue. Look up dystrophic calcification in a pathology book. And if you do that, you'll see that it's one of your body's responses to chronic inflammation. Somehow you lay down calcium deposits. I'm not sure how it's done, uh, but that's something I learned in medical school in pathology at USC in Los Angeles. I was taught by some of the best pathologists in the world. Clive Taylor and Pakarana Chandrasoma. They actually wrote the textbook on pathology, medical pathology in Los Angeles at USC. And they were also the course directors for pathology at USC. So I was very fortunate. How are we doing on irrigation? Thank you. No, we need uh, you know, three more minutes, maybe four more minutes, so. All right. Yeah. This is the disc that just keeps on giving. Yeah, the pressure up would be nice. I don't, don't know that I have enough pressure. Getting a lot of little pieces here. So once again, for those of you who joined us late, this patient had a microdiscectomy done and it failed. It didn't work. And I think it was done right here. You can see scar tissue. And I think the L45 is where he had it done, okay? So unfortunately, it did a lot of damage to his disc. All this golden stuff, all this white stuff is all scar tissue. And here he is now having another surgery. Very common, if you have a microdiscectomy or laminectomy, it doesn't treat back pain. It only is designed to treat leg pain. So all these surgeries that are done by these sur spine surgeons, they cause more back pain because they injure the disc even more and they injure the spine. I think someday we can expect to see microdiscectomy as a thing of the past. It's kind of like uh, the old telephones that used to sit on our walls and desks many years ago. Nobody uses them anymore.
Yeah, because the microdiscectomy never fixes the tear. Okay. Because it doesn't fix the tear, there's still a tear there. So and there's more herniation that happens because you're not, you're not debriding the annular tear. The Duke laser disc repair is the only surgery in the world that debrides the tear, allowing the disc to heal properly. There's still a piece of herniation down there. I have to go get. This is taking a little bit longer than I thought, but you can see a lot of scar tissue from his prior surgery. Thick, thick, thick scar tissue right here. Now, as you get to the outside of the disc annulus, from the inside of the annulus to the outside of that tear, you're going to see more scar tissue because there's more blood vessels on the outside of the disc. So that's where scar tissue comes from is inflammation. You have to have blood, blood vessels to have inflammation. You have to have inflammation to have scar tissue. So it stands to reason that the further out towards the periphery of the herniation, you're going to get more inflammatory tissue and more scar tissue. Big tear here. Oh, look at all that scar tissue. This is lateral in the disc. I turn my scope 180 degrees and I'm looking towards the lateral view. That's medial towards the spine and that's lateral towards, the, towards me. Okay, you have to clean both directions. If you don't get both directions, the tear won't heal properly. There's that other piece. Anyone ever see the movie, The 13th Warrior? Antonio Banderas? It's an old movie. I don't believe I have. Oh my God, great movie. Especially if you like Viking culture, the Norsemen, incredible. Yeah, switch, yeah, do it. And thank you for letting us know. I thought we'd be done by now, but unfortunately there's, there's just too much herniation to get rid of. So it looks like I'm just about done. Remember, this disc was a bit more collapsed. If you look at the x-ray, you can see the 4-5 was more collapsed. Doesn't matter. We're going to get rid of his pain at the disc. I feel very confident. You could have bone on bone. As long as you do an annular debridement, you get rid of the back pain or neck pain. So this disc, by the way, um, if I counted all the herniations, we're up at around 30 now for this one disc. We had a really big one you all saw earlier. And then um, he ha has a lot of small ones. Now, normally, if you have a normal disc and you reach in with a grabber, you're not going to get herniations coming out like we are because the disc is intact. It's one, one piece of disc. It's a giant disc, you know? But because, because this disc has taken on so much damage over the years, there's so many pieces of herniation. All right, we're done. Let me just get the laser one more time on that thing there, that, and we'll be done. So here's what I'd like you all to do. Type up your questions, and I'm gonna come and answer them for you. That's a bone spur, by the way, right there. People want to know, does laser remove bone spur? Absolutely. Done. All done. Beautiful. So type your questions up for me, and I'll come answer them for you, all right? But otherwise, the surgery went very well for this young man. I think he's going to be very happy. He's going to notice the pain's gone right away. Okay. Go ahead and run a comparison of the fusion, which would have been his alternative surgery. If you're thinking about have, if you're having a spinal fusion, don't do it. Get the Duke laser disc repaired. Much better surgery. Okay. Duke laser disc repair. A comparison with traditional spinal fusion surgery. A patient with chronic back or neck pain originating from a symptomatic disc injury could undergo either traditional spinal fusion or less invasive Duke laser disc repair. This MRI represents a typical case with L45 and L5S1 symptomatic discs. A symptomatic disc causing neck or back pain can include bulging discs, herniated discs, ruptured discs, degenerative discs, 
protruding discs, spinal stenosis, radiculopathy, and sciatica. This patient can choose traditional fusion surgery or the Duke laser disc repair to help alleviate the pain caused by and within the symptomatic discs. Here, two patients with comparable disc injuries are treated. On the left, the highly invasive spinal fusion, and on the right, the least invasive Duke laser disc repair. The spinal fusion requires a very large incision, usually leaving a large scar. The Duke laser disc repair requires only a very small incision, usually less than a half an inch long. In this small opening, a cylindrical rod, called a dilator, is inserted to gently spread the muscle to create a small passage and guide through which the surgery is performed endoscopically. The incision for the fusion continues, including penetrating the skin, fat tissue, and multiple layers of muscle through to the bone. With the Duke laser disc repair, a mallet is used to advance the tip of the dilator into the symptomatic disc. A tube, called the tubular retractor, slides over the dilator and is carefully positioned into the disc, again using the mallet. The rest of the entire Duke laser disc repair surgery will occur inside this narrow tube. To access the spine, the spinal fusion requires the muscle to be separated from the vertebrae. This very invasive action causes trauma and permanent damage to the muscles. Whereas in the endoscopic Duke laser disc repair, the muscle is not damaged. The endoscope camera is inserted into the tubular retractor to allow the surgeon to guide the laser inside each symptomatic disc. To accommodate the fusion hardware, a large bone grabber is used to perform a laminectomy by removing bone from the spine. The fiber optic laser used in the Duke laser disc repair is manipulated with great accuracy to remove only painful inflammatory tissue from the disc. In this highly magnified view, the laser is used to precisely remove damaged disc material that is causing the pain. The laser is debreeding, or essentially vaporizing, damaged tissue in the disc's outer layer, or annulus, specifically at the annular tear, the source of the rupture or herniation and pain. After the fusion patient's damaged discs are removed, a metal or plastic cage housing bone grafting material is inserted in place of the removed discs. Once the laser has removed the painful part of the annular tear, the endoscope and tubular retractor are removed, leaving less than one half inch incision in the skin, which is closed with a single stitch, strips, and a band-aid. Total time for the Duke laser disc repair surgery, approximately one hour. The fusion, however, is still underway. Holes in the spine must be tapped in preparation for the large pedicle screws that anchor the fusion hardware. The Duke laser disc repair patient is in recovery usually 45 to 60 minutes before release to go home. The fusion screws are inserted into the bone, as shown in the x-ray. After all screws are in place, rods are used to connect the screws together to prevent movement of the secured vertebrae. Cross links are added to bridge the rods together for additional stability. Fusion hardware, by design, is to fuse joints that normally move, preventing natural movement in the damaged portion of the spine. Whereas with the Duke laser disc repair, there is no loss of movement. Normal movement and flexibility of the disc and joints is preserved. The Duke laser disc repair patient is soon back home, enjoying life, with a very fast recovery, allowing normal activities without pain. Meanwhile, bone graft material is placed throughout the fusion surgery site. These morselized pieces of bone will eventually grow together to help promote the fusion process. Prior to closing the wound, a temporary drain is installed to allow excess fluid to drain. Average surgery time of a traditional two-level fusion is two and a half hours, with an additional three to four hours in the recovery room. As we've seen in comparison, a spinal fusion requires a much larger incision and results in a significant amount of scar tissue. The Duke laser disc repair's half-inch incision leaves no scar tissue around the spine or nerves. A large amount of bone is removed with a spinal fusion. With the Duke laser disc repair, no bone is removed. Each disc is accessed through a natural opening in the spine. The entire disc is completely removed in a spinal fusion, even though only 5% may be damaged. The Duke laser disc repair leaves the normal parts of the disc in place and removes only the painful annular tear on the damaged disc. Fusion requires hardware, including screws, rods, plates, etc. The Duke laser disc repair does not require any hardware. The patient is totally hardware-free. Fusion surgery is very invasive. 
Cutting and moving the muscle structures and tissues for a spinal fusion causes trauma, resulting in permanent damage to the muscles. Whereas with the Duke laser disc repair, there is no damage to the muscles. The Duke laser disc repair is the least invasive surgery available to repair a damaged disc. With spinal fusions, patients are required to take highly addictive narcotic painkillers, which can cause constipation, bowel, and bladder complications. Due to the minimal pain, narcotics are not needed with the Duke laser disc repair. Spinal fusions have a high risk for infection. The Duke laser disc repair has a very low risk for infection. In the seven years the Duke laser disc repair has been performed, there have been no infections. Spinal fusion surgery has a very long recovery and requires a great deal of physical therapy and time to heal from the trauma in the muscles and the spine itself. Whereas the recovery from Duke laser disc repair is in a matter of hours or days, rather than weeks or months. With fusion, the spine is being fused together, losing movement. Whereas there is no fusion with the Duke laser disc repair, normal movements of the joints in the spine is preserved. Spinal fusion results in loss of mobility. There is no mobility loss with the Duke laser disc repair. In fact, most Duke laser disc repair patients experience improved mobility after the surgery. The Duke laser disc repair is FDA approved. All the instruments and equipment used are FDA approved. This proprietary surgery itself has been peer reviewed and published and is performed exclusively at the Duke Spine Institute. With the highest published success rate of 95%, the Duke laser disc repair is proven to be the most successful and least damaging spinal surgery in the world for the treatment of symptomatic damaged discs causing back pain, neck pain, sciatica, and radiculopathy due to herniated, degenerated, or bulging discs. I'm Dr. Arjit Majin here at the Duke Spine Institute with one of my patients who's traveled from North Carolina uh, because he had some herniated discs in his lower back and he was having problems with the back. What kind of problems brought you to Duke Spine Institute? Dr. Duke, it was severe pain, pain that I had never experienced before and pain that scared me so much that I thought it was going to change the way I lived. I, I've got a family and I'm active and it literally scared me to death. And as I'm talking to you right now, the hair standing up on my neck, the, the pain that I was suffering and where I thought I was, I didn't think there was going to be an answer. And you were pretty much bedridden. You couldn't get out of bed. I remember you showed up here in a wheelchair because any standing was causing sciatic type pain in your leg. Yeah, there was no doubt. And that's not an over uh, exaggeration where I could maybe get up, for, uh, f like stand for 15, 20 seconds so I could get to the bathroom to go urinate, for instance. But then when I got there, I had to lay on the floor so I could rest up a little bit so I could stand with pain to even be able to try to urinate. And this went on for two, two and a half weeks. It was absolutely brutal. And there was no respite. Pain that I have had in the past, I could find some position where there was some respite from the pain and there was nothing. So your wife is a physician. Uh, was she able to fix your back problem for you? I wish. No, I mean, she, you know, she consoled me. And in the town that we come from, we know a lot of folks. And um, to be absolutely honest, we just weren't getting a lot of help. And like I said, um, we know a lot of folks and it was prolonged and we were talking about pain management and, and all that. And it, it, that's just not for me. And uh, like I said, I was scared to death. The problem with pain management, unfortunately, is that it doesn't fix the issue when you have a herniated disc yeah. and back pain from a herniated disc because you need surgery on that disc to repair it. That's what the Duke Laser Disc Repair did. And you can actually see here that we went into his disc with the endoscope and we were cleaning out the herniation with the laser. Yeah. And the laser actually makes a huge difference. People say, oh, lasers, they're not used in, in spine surgery, but they are. And they're very, very powerful tools and very precise. So we were able to clean out your discs, remove the herniation, and how do you feel today? I feel great. I mean, uh, it's probably, I mean, I know I'm on camera right here, but I literally could not walk into the office yesterday. Yesterday. And I'll just, I mean, you're gonna see my shorts and everything, you have to edit, yeah, no, whatever, good. but I'm able to walk. That's awesome. And, I, and I'm, I'm just, it wasn't even close. I was actually, and I'm, it's, I, I don't know if you can tell from the camera that what my personality is, but I'm a, 
I, I try to be very polite and I was apologizing for profusely sweating because I hurt so bad. It's not because of the Florida heat by any means, it's because I hurt so bad. I never experienced pain like that. And like I said, there's because no less you're, you're a redneck too, <laughs> you know, you're not that far from Florida. That's you're right. Just, uh, just right. up a state or two, right? That's right. Yeah. A couple of states. So you're feeling better today. It's been less than 24 hours since yep. we did your surgery. You went home an hour after the surgery, back to your hotel with yep. your lovely family who I met. Yep. And uh, how do they feel about your progress? They're happy that I'm happy. You know what I mean? Because they were scared too. You know, now they were putting on strong, a strong front, but I really, I am just telling you, I was at my wits end. And I certainly are a lot more appreciative of people who have pain that I'm aware of because when there's no rest from it, oh my gosh. You know what I mean? I was really at my wits end and you saved me. So I appreciate you very much. You are welcome, sir. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to say to your fans out there? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I, I could have pretty up for you a little bit better. So just had surgery yesterday. All right. Cut me some slack. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> and you're heading back home today, correct? Yeah, we're going back on the plane later, so later this evening. The kids are going to swim a little bit down here in Melbourne. I am just going to rest and watch TV, but then we're going to get on the plane a little bit. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, congratulations. Yeah. You had faith. Yes. You took the leap and you got the surgery done. Yes, sir. All right. Awesome. Yeah. And good afternoon, almost. I'm Dr. Duke Majin. We're just wrapping up uh, Duke Laser Disc Repair for a patient who has been suffering with back pain for about nine years. Now, he injured his back at some point in the past, just like you saw on our animation videos. And when he had the injury, the wall around the disc, which is called the annulus fibrosis, it's literally made up of 25 layers of collagen, which is a connective tissue, and it's crisscrossed, okay? And it's 25 layers all the way around the disc of connective tissue that's crisscrossed. It's designed to hold the jelly in the middle of the disc in place, so the jelly cannot escape. However, when human beings do things like we see on Fail Army, you end up falling and hurting yourself and your spine jolts and it rips the fibers of the annulus wide open. And once the tear happens, now you've got a weak spot in your wall. And by the way, those tears, they typically happen in the back of the disc. So if you look at this model, this is the front, this is the back, this is the disc, this is the front of the disc, and this is the back of the disc. So we were talking about the tears in the back of the disc, either off to the right side or off to the left side. And guess what comes out right behind that weak spot? The nerve root. So a lot of times a herniated disc is going to interact with the nerve going down your leg or down your arm. And it's going to cause either sciatic pain down your leg or pain down your arm. We call that radiculopathy. So here's another view. There's the neuroforamen. There's the nerve coming out right there, the yellow thing. Notice how it's right in the back of the disc. So herniations can actually cause arm and leg symptoms, whether it's weakness, numbness, tingling like pins and needles, we call that paresthesias in the medical terminology, or pain shooting down the leg or shooting down the arm. If it's any of those four symptoms, it's coming from the nerve root. The nerve root leaves the hole called the neuroforamen. It travels all the way down to your toe. Or if it's in the neck, it travels all the way down to your fingertips. And pinching or irritating that nerve in your neck or your back is going to make you feel like you got a problem with your leg or your arm. That's called referred pain. And fixing the disc like we did today with the Duke Laser Disc Repair treats referred pain, uh, which is pain affecting the nerve root <clears throat> in the foramen that goes down the leg. So our patient today had back pain and leg symptoms. And both of them were coming from two discs, the L45 and the L5S1. Now to get to those discs, I didn't go through the lamina called translaminar. I didn't drill this away. I went around the side of the spine in a procedure called the transforaminal. Okay, transforaminal means to cross the foramen. And we came in just under the exiting nerve root. And that's what you saw today. So let's take our first, uh, uh, next questions. All right. By the way, feel free to type up questions. I'm happy to answer them for you. We do have one more surgery 
Our next patient's gonna be uh, having the Duke laser disc repair done at L34, both sides at L45, and then L5S1. So I think he's a left 3-4, bilateral 4-5, right 5-1. Why? Well, he's got herniations on both sides. It's affecting both legs. He's coming from Canada. He does not want to have to come back here for a second surgery. So he wants to get it all done in one sitting. The surgery will take us an hour and a half to do. We're going to enter into four tears. One, two, three, four annular tears and repair all four annular tears. Um, Ryan, these first two questions come from Paul on Facebook. And Paul asks, Hi Paul. Why isn't this particular procedure being taught in medical school? Paul, you have asked a stellar question. Why is this technology not taught in medical school? Well, I'm gonna tell you why. Special interest. Have you ever heard of something called the military industrial complex? What the military industrial complex is, is it's a bunch of businesses that make gazillions of dollars profit by selling tanks, missiles, helicopters, all that kind of war equipment to our government. Okay. And you've heard of the old story, a toilet seat costs a $10,000, right? Or a hamburger to the military costs, you know, a hundred bucks per hamburger. It's all true. It's basically um, big business making massive profits, selling things. So what's being sold in the spine? That's it right there. Screws, rods, metal plates, cages. I mean, you name it, they've got it for sale. Artificial discs, cages. The problem is, is that they have infiltrated medical schools and residencies where surgeons are trained. And they literally live at the hospital with the residents. They're the residents' best friends. Let me tell you something about being a resident. I was a resident in neurosurgery for seven years at UF in Gainesville. I went to residency with one purpose. I wanted the best training I could get in neurosurgery. So I decided to leave California and come to Florida where the best neurosurgery training program was at the time, back in 1997, when I started my training. It was the Gainesville University of Florida. I made a huge commitment. I left my family, my home. I stayed seven years living in a hospital. We literally work 110 to 120 hours a week. And we're paid, I was paid $30,000 a year. So if you figure out my hourly rate, it was probably something around five bucks an hour. And that's doing neurosurgery. That was for seven years. Doesn't matter, I didn't care about the money. But I needed enough money to live off of. And the truth is, is it's tight when you're a resident. You're making thirty dollars to $40,000. Every year you go up a thousand. And um, cost of living's high. So a lot of these residents rely on the generosity of companies like the companies that make screws and rods and what do they do well they invite the residents out to the bar to go have a beer on Friday or Saturday uh, they can do a lot more than that I would not take advantage of them I had maybe one or two dinners my entire residency but some of the spine residents well they live off the generosity of these implant companies so by the time they're done with seven years of surgery they are indebted to these companies they're basically an indentured servant Long story short, they're not interested in doing anything that doesn't involve putting metal into patients. Metal is big money, not just for the companies, but also for the surgeons. I get paid 10 times uh, what I get paid for laser surgery doing fusions, okay? So these traditional surgeries, whether it's a microdiscectomy, laminectomy, they never work. They always lead to a metal fusion or artificial disc. These surgeons just see patients, unfortunately, as what's called an annuity, which is a financial term. It's an instrument. It basically pays you a dividend every year. And the reason that patients pay surgeons every year is because they're never fixed. And the surgeons just keep operating. And you hear about people getting five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten back surgeries and neck surgeries. It's, it's a shame. Uh, but that's what's happening. And I can't stop it. All I can do is get out here and educate people like I'm doing. I'm not a multimillionaire. I don't have a marketing budget. I'm already paying these people to do these broadcasts out of my own pocket. Why? Because I don't want to see people used as a, basically a piece of meat. Um, it's unethical. It's not why I went into medicine. 
So I can't fix a system that's broken, but you know what? You can fix a system. You, the patients, the viewers, why? You can demand your surgeons give you the right care, the best care. And that's what I suggest you do. There was a second question from Paul? Yes, second question from Paul. Um, they asked, what would be the reasoning for open surgery uh, versus the laser uh, procedure? Um, what would be the reason for open surgery? Yeah, what would be the reasoning for open surgery? I think you meant fusion uh, versus uh, the laser procedure. Yeah, the reason for open surgery is that there's um, 7,000 spine surgeons in the United States and only one of them does the proper surgery, the endoscopic Duke laser disc repair. The other 6,999, well, this is what they do. They do metal, they do fusions, they do artificial discs. Like I told you, they're, they're highly motivated financially to do it. It's kind of part of the system. These are sheeple. These surgeons are sheeple. They don't think outside the box. They just do what they were told to do. They're, they're controlled through the matrix. What else can I say? Um, that's why more people aren't doing it. It's it's all financial. It's all part of that spine industrial complex. And, uh, these next two questions come from uh, John Christian on YouTube. Hello, John Christian. Thanks for asking questions. And they asked, uh, first question, how does your technique differ when treating a central herniation slash protrusion at the back of the disc as proposed to one on either of the back sides? Great question. So um, you've asked a phenomenal question. How do you deal with a central herniation? Um, and basically it's not just my problem, it's any surgeon's problem. Why? Because traditional surgery removes the bones and ligaments in the back of the spine. You approach the fecal sac, it's a bundle of nerves. You've got to go to the side of it and pull it medially to try to get to the central herniation. Impossible. As a matter of fact, the Duke laser disc repair is a far better way to do central located herniations. Here's why. If the central herniation is located, let's say right there in the center, if you come this way, you have the nerves blocking you, you gotta pull them to the side. You can only pull them so much before you get nerve damage. So traditional surgery doesn't allow you to get to a central herniation. But the Duke laser disc repair does because we just go further from the side and we reach across towards the middle because we're coming from the side anyway. So the D DLDR allows us to get the central herniations in the lower back and thoracic. Awesome. Uh, second question from John. He asks, with a success rate of 95%, what are some of the examples of, of the 5% that were unsuccessful? Hey, great question. So we talk about a success rate at Duke Spine Institute of 95%. We're not talking about 95% of our patients have successful surgery. 100% of our patients have successful surgery. What the 95% is, is when we ask our patients afterwards, how much of your lower back pain did we get rid of with the surgery? Give me a percentage. Mostly it's 100%. Sometimes we'll get a 95, we'll get a 90. Rarely will we get an 80. We never get anything below an 80. Why? Because we're spot on when we make the diagnosis. So the range is somewhere around 80 to 100 with most of the patients having 100% elimination of their back pain. The percentage of 95% is not 95% of our patients have a good outcome. All of the patients have a good outcome. 95% is the average amount of pain relief each person gets. So it's far better than you probably imagined. All right. The second one comes from, I'm so sorry if I cannot pronounce the name. I'm just gonna go with Viv. Viv. Yeah, Viv from YouTube. Um, Hi Viv from YouTube. They uh, said T-lift surgery. Can you explain surgery? T-lift surgery. I can tell you all about T-lift surgery. I've done 1,000 T-lift surgeries in my career for 26 years. They, there's one word that summarizes it. Forget it. <laughs> Maybe that's two words. <laughs> you don't want a T-lift surgery. It's highly invasive. What it is is um, T-lift stands for transforaminal lumbar interbody fusion. As a matter of fact, I've published a paper on T-lift surgery. If you look up PubMed, National Library of Medicine, search uh, Dr. Ara Duke Majin, you'll see that I published a paper on combined transforaminal lumbar interbody surgery and posterolateral arthrodesis. So I'm an expert on it. I don't do it really much anymore because the laser's better. But basically the surgeon makes a big incision, 
peels your muscles off your spine, then they hit these bones, they have to get down to the disc. So they remove the bones called the laminotomy, laminectomy. Now we have a, a clear path down to the disc. Then we clean the disc out using instruments from the back. And then we put a cage in that disc and bone graft. And this is what it looks like right here. You see the cage right there between the bones. Yeah. So we put that in through the back through the transforaminal approach. Then you put in screws and rods. What's wrong with the surgery? Everything. You're having bleeding. You're going to have horrible pain after surgery for weeks and months. You'll be on opioid painkillers. You don't want to be on opioids. They're dangerous, highly addicting, dangerous drugs. The Duke laser <coughs> disc repair that you just watched, we don't put people on opioids. They don't take opioids after surgery. They don't need it. So the Duke laser disc repair, no scar tissue, T-lift, lots of scar tissue. Duke laser disc repair, no bleeding, T-lift, bleeding galore. Duke laser disc repair, no post-operative pain, T-lift, massive post-operative pain. You're going to need to be on opioids for months. Duke laser disc repair, go back to, go back to work in a couple of days. T-lift, go back to work in three to six months if you're lucky. Duke laser disc repair, no complications to date with the surgery and the technique. T-lift complication rate is as high as 25 to 50 percent. You're going to have a complication that you need to deal with, whether it's a blood clot, pneumonia, heart attack, rehospitalization, wound infection, migrated cage, instrument failure, pain, adjacent segment disease, whatever. Lots of complications with T-lift. Duke laser disc repair, cheap, uh, inexpensive, I should say. T-lift, very expensive, twice, three times as much. That's just the starters. All right, any other questions? Yes, one more question. This comes from uh, Siju on YouTube. Hello, Siju. And Welcome. They ask, hi, doctor. Can I, uh, can I know that doing a, PL, a PELD spinal surgery and getting pregnant after two years, what is the risk involved in delivery and post? Great question. So. First of all, PELD is a percutaneous lumbar discectomy, endoscopic discectomy. I don't do that surgery. We don't do percutaneous procedures. We do um, Duke laser disc repair. So I'm not sure if you're talking about my surgery that you just watched or you're talking about something else. But if you have my surgery, can you get pregnant after the surgery? Absolutely, 100%. And usually within one year, the disc is completely healed and strong. You can get pregnant, you can carry a baby to term, you're not gonna have any more back problems because we're fixing the source of the, the problem, which is the tear. And that's it. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. We'll be back in about 30 minutes with uh, the last